Darkcast Network. Indie pods with a dark side. Hey y'all, this is Ash from Creepy Tapas Podcast. There are a few places selling stickers these days, but I found a small business on Etsy called Snarky Sticker Lady, and I am in love with her stuff. We all love snark around here on the Darkcast Network. When I looked at the shop, I was surprised because she has some really funny stickers. The owner, Allison, knows that pride is not a sin, and she designed a line of stickers for friends of the LGBTQIA community. Allison has said of her own business, I love stickers. I love making stickers. I love putting stickers on everything. I started making stickers because I wanted some snarky, smart ass stickers and nobody had them. I need my sarcastic flag to fly, honey. So after making some snarky stickers, I started making lots of other types of stickers too. As a loyal friend to the LGBTQIA community, I wanted some stickers to show how I feel, so I made them. Ha! Maybe you'd like to show how you feel too. All sticker designs are welcome in my shop. Just send your ideas in. All of Allison's stickers are vinyl and laminated, so they are water resistant and will last a really long time. Check her out on Etsy at etsy.com shop snarky sticker lady. Hey, but up boop boo, I want to get snarky with you. Snarky sticker lady on Etsy. Hey there, rainbow warriors. If you've been listening, you know it's been a rough few months with a member of my forensic team being sick. Lily, my orange kitty of 17 years, passed away the other night, and I just haven't felt like researching and writing, I'm afraid. I do have a new episode in the works, as well as a Patreon-exclusive episode I'm working on for the end of the month. I just need a few days, I think, to get out of my funk and focus on the show. In the meantime, I'm re-releasing an episode I did in my first season. The case is that of Matthew Shepard. This year will be 25 years since Matthew Shepard was murdered. This case, although I know it's been covered many times by many podcasts, is probably the most famous of all LGBTQ murders. While all the stories of LGBTQ victims are important, This particular one was instrumental in creating the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Federal Anti-Hate Crime Law. Now remember, this was way back in my first season of podcasting when I first released this episode. So please be gentle with me. I'll be back to you soon with a new case episode and a Patreon exclusive for Patreon members. Love you guys. You matter. And remember... It's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. Now on with the case of Matthew Shepard, Three Rainbowed. Kind of. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBT. I'm your host, CJ. This episode was suggested by a member of our Facebook group named Chloe. Thanks, Chloe. This past October marked 21 years since a college student named Matthew Shepard was driven out to a cattle field. He was driven out by two young men about his age. 21-year-old Matthew was bound to a pasture fence beaten, set afire, and left out in the cold to die in Laramie, Wyoming, the night of October 6, 1998. This story is the foundation to two stories with the same ending. The story is of Matthew Shepard, his death, and a little bit about the trial of his murderers. The other part of the story is what happened when a gay journalist, Stephen Jimenez, goes to Wyoming, he does some research, interviews some people, and he writes a book called The Book of Matt. What Stephen Jimenez tells about the killer's motives is far different than the motives that were first presented. What Stephen Jimenez tells about Matthew Shepard has people with hateful agendas praising Matthew's death. It has some bloggers writing that Matthew Shepard was nothing more than a meth-peddling sodomite being used as an LGB martyr post-mortem. So I say... Let's listen to the stories and cut through the crap. Rainbow Warriors, why was Matthew Shepard killed? 
Matthew Wayne Shepard was born December 1, 1976 in Casper, Wyoming. He was a Sagittarius. Matthew, Matt, was the firstborn of two boys to Judy and Dennis Shepard. Matt was kind, sensitive, and soft-spoken. He went through the Casper public school system until his dad accepted a job in Syria as an oil safety engineer. Matt spent his senior year of high school at the American School in Switzerland. There, he was able to study German, Italian, and theater. Fashion and music were some of Matt's obsessions in his leisure time. After graduating from high school, Matt, who had known about his sexual orientation for quite a while, came out to his mom. His mom said she had known and not to worry. His parents loved him no matter what. Not long after high school, Matt took a trip with a few of his friends to Morocco. I think I should probably mention Matt was a petite young man. He was only 5'2 and maybe 100 pounds wet. On this trip to Morocco, Matt was attacked by some local men. He was robbed, beaten, and raped. The police in Morocco never found the guys who did this to Matt. After the attack, Matt suffered from depression, anxiety, and even thoughts of suicide. Matt was in therapy for these conditions, and he took antidepressant medication. Matt went back to the United States, and he lived for a short time in Raleigh, North Carolina. There, he attended a theater school before he returned to Casper, Wyoming. He enrolled at Casper Junior College, and he met a vibrant lesbian named Romaine Patterson. The two hit it off, and they moved to Denver, Colorado together. Matt decided to move back to Wyoming in 1998. Laramie, Wyoming, to be precise. He was still having anxieties from his attack in Morocco, and he thought maybe living in a smaller town would make him feel safer. So Matt enrolled at the University of Wyoming, where both of his parents had attended college. Matt decided to study political science and foreign affairs. He knew he wanted to do something in the field of international relations. At 21 years old, Matt became active on campus and joined the college's LGBT Student Alliance. October 6, 1998, after a meeting on campus for the LGB Student Alliance, Matt went alone to the Fireside Lounge to grab a beer. This was not a gay bar, as Laramie, Wyoming had no such thing as a gay bar. About an hour later, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson walked in. Both of these guys were high school dropouts, with Russell being the more passive of the two young men. The two gathered their coins and they paid for a pitcher of beer. Once they got their pitcher of beer, they went and started shooting pool. Not long after that, they engaged Matt in conversation. At some point, either Matt told the guys he was too drunk to drive home, or the guys just offered to give Matt a ride home. Russell got behind the wheel of Aaron's dad's truck. Then Matt was in the middle and Aaron was in the passenger seat. Apparently, Aaron had had his driver's license revoked and couldn't drive. They started driving when Aaron pulled out a pistol and he ordered Matt to give him his wallet. Matt refused at first, and this caused Aaron to hit him in the head with the pistol butt. Matt handed over his wallet that only contained 20 bucks. Aaron had popped Matt in the head with his pistol butt a few times. They drove Matt out to a pasture on a cattle farm. Aaron pulled Matt out of the truck and he told Russell to grab the rope in the truck. Aaron dragged Matt to the fence and he yelled to Russell, Tie him up. Russell tied Matt to a deer fence while Aaron kept beating on Matt. Aaron said he punched and pistol whipped Matt up to 18 times and they burned him with cigarettes. Russell chuckled a little when Aaron was beating on Matt, but it could have been from nerves. At one point, Russell tried to stop Aaron from attacking Matt and Aaron hit Russell in the face with the pistol butt. Russell was pissed, so he went back to the truck and he left Aaron alone with Matt. Aaron continued to beat Matt in his head so severely it fractured his skull. Aaron took Matt's shoes off and he lit Matt's clothes on fire. Aaron then threw Matt's shoes in the back of the truck and got in. Russell and Aaron drove off. The two young men in the truck were headed towards Matt's apartment to steal whatever they could find there. They stopped in Matt's neighborhood and they were accosted by two teenage boys that were out vandalizing cars. A fight ensued and police came. They took Russell and Aaron and the two teens into custody. At the pasture, Matt was unconscious from the beatings he took. Somehow the fire on his clothes went out 
and Matt was left for about 18 hours in the cold, tied to the fence. Matt was found by a mountain biker who was trying to maneuver his bicycle over some rocky terrain. The cyclist said he thought Matt was a scarecrow at first, and then he got closer and he could see it was a real person. He started to yell at Matt to get him to move, show some sign of life, but Matt wasn't moving. The cyclist ran for help to the nearest house he could find to call 911. A sheriff's unit responded and Deputy Reggie Flutie got out of her car and went to check on Matt. At first, because of his small frame, she thought he was a child. As the deputy ran up to Matt, she spooked a deer who was laying next to him. Now that's a really small detail, but possibly a very spiritual one for some. Deputy Flutie felt that the doe was watching over Matt until help came. When the deputy reached Matt, he was still unconscious. His face was bloodied, other than the trails from tears that were staining his cheeks. She called for assistance and an ambulance. The deputy did what she could to revive Matt. Later, the deputy learned that Matt was living with the HIV virus. The deputy had a bunch of little cuts all over her hands from fixing a wire fence at her home. She put gloves on before touching Matt, but the gloves were cheap plastic ones purchased by the county, and they had a tendency to break easy. The deputy was put on an aggressive post-exposure medical regime to reduce her likelihood of contracting the disease. A few days later, she was found to be HIV negative. Matt was rushed by ambulance to a hospital in Laramie before being transferred to a hospital with a more advanced trauma unit in Fort Collins, Colorado. He suffered from extreme brainstem damage with injuries too severe for doctors to operate. He was then put on life support and he was kept alive until his parents could fly back to the United States from Syria. Matt died six days later. While Matt was in the hospital fighting for his life, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson were again arrested, but this time for kidnapping, robbery, and the attempted murder of Matt. When Matt died, the charges were upgraded to first-degree murder, which made the crime eligible for the death penalty. While in the police station, Aaron McKinney was being interrogated. He told the police he didn't know Matt and he had never seen him before. He at first called Matt some kid who wanted a ride home. The police asked what he looked like, and Aaron replied, like a queer, like a fag, you know? Aaron said Matt was drunk and was grabbing his crotch, and Aaron told him, I'm not a fucking faggot. Then he hit him with his fist in the butt of his gun. Aaron also said in his statement to police that after he hit Matt, Matt was all over him trying to hug him. If you could only hear my eyes roll. Oh, yes, it makes everyone much more lustful to be smacked around and hit in the head with the butt of a pistol. Aaron's story changed later, although he did use the gay panic defense in court. Basically, Aaron said that he and Russell were just out to roll Matt for money. He kicked the shit out of Matt, but he didn't mean to kill him. He didn't mean to kill him, yet he lit Matt's clothes on fire left him incapacitated, tied to a fence in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, in 32-degree weather. Sure as hell sounds to me like he was trying to kill him. Russell was, too, for that matter. He knew Matt was weak and beaten. He knew how cold it was. He knew Aaron took Matt's shoes. So even if Matt was able to come to consciousness, even if Matt was able to unbind himself, There's no way Matt would be able to walk far with no shoes on his feet. The trial came, and although Aaron and Russell used the gay panic defense, it didn't help. They were both sentenced to two life sentences for kidnapping and murdering Matt Shepard. For Aaron's part in the murder, the death penalty was on the table. Matt's father, Dennis, wanted nothing more than for Aaron to get the death penalty. But Dennis was persuaded by his wife, Judy, to honor Matt's peaceful, sweet nature into asking the court to not give Aaron the death penalty. Matt's body was cremated, as his parents were afraid that if they buried him, the area he was buried would be desecrated. His service was held on the steps of the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. There were at least a thousand people in attendance, including Ellen DeGeneres. Oh. 
and what memorial service wouldn't be complete without being graced by that fucker Fred Phelps and his cuckoo for Cocoa Puff Westboro Baptist Church waving their God hates fag signs in everyone's face. Matt's murder opened up a national conversation regarding the LGBT hate crimes in the U.S. Eleven years after Matt's death, Congress finally passed a bill expanding federal hate crime laws to include a person's sexual orientation. Here's where the next part of this story comes in. Stephen Jimenez came out as gay in 1970. He's a journalist, a TV producer, and the author of the Book of Matt. In 2005 and 2006, he and his fellow journalist Elizabeth Vargas shared an award for investigative reporting covering the Matt Shepard case on ABC's 2020. The Book of Matt essentially paints the picture of Matthew Shepard being a meth head. Aaron McKinney, Matt's killer, he was bisexual. Matt and Aaron knew each other well. They were friends, and they were sexually active with one another. They were also male prostitutes. And Stephen Jimenez throws another character into the mix, someone he interviewed for this expose. This character's name is Doc O'Connor. Doc's a limo driver, and he would drive Aaron and Matt around. He would take Aaron and Matt to parties where there was known meth and heroin usage and sex. Sometimes Doc would even partake in both with the boys. Another person Stephen had interviewed was a woman who owned an antique shop, and apparently she knew everything that was going on around town. She knew Laramie, Wyoming had a huge gay population. She knew this and what everyone's sexual orientation was. Why? Because she had a friend whose son was gay. So she knew Aaron and Matt hung out together and that Russell Henderson hung out with the gays too. So there's no way Matt was killed for being gay. The true motive was money. Aaron needed money and he believed that there was a huge meth drop coming in from Colorado. It was going to be worth at least $10,000. He also believed that Matt could lead him to it. His plan was to take Matt out to a remote area and beat the information out of him. Rainbow Warriors, do you see where I'm going with all this? The lady who said she knew Laramie, Wyoming has a huge gay population? <laughs> I know when I want to party with like-minded peeps, Laramie, Wyoming just pops out to me. It's totally right up there with San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York. Aaron McKinney's statement was riddled with homophobic slurs, and he insisted he had no clue who Matt Shepard was. He kept calling him either the faggot or the queer or just that kid. I heard the tapes of the interrogation. I read the dialogue notes. Okay, so say Matt was a meth head. Say he and Aaron were friends and drug dealers. It wasn't like Matt had the drugs on him. If he's your friend and sometimes lover, why torture him like that? Stephen Jimenez interviewed maybe 20 people. Most all of them he cites are anonymous sources. The ones he does name, they're involved in drugs or not very credible. So what the fuck, Stephen Jimenez? You go to this town where this treacherous murder had taken place years earlier and you interview some very questionable sources and you write this shit calling it investigative journalism. Do you even know the fuckery you have stirred with this bullshit of a book you've concocted? The fuckery from religious zealots excited Matthew died. Is it possible to have you exiled from the LGBT community altogether? Banished with a rainbow A painted on the chest of all your shirts? This book is a disgrace to Matthew Shepard's memory. There's a lot of people out there that do believe Stephen Jimenez's expose. Why? Because it was on 2020. It has to be the truth, right? The book of Matt. Stephen Jimenez must be a gay prophet, and this is his Bible. So it must all be true. I don't think so. The facts of the case don't add up to his book. If Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson knew Matt Pryor, why not just own up to it at confession time? I mean, what else did they have to lose? They're already facing the death penalty for murder. What's confessing to being involved in drugs going to do? 
They both insisted they didn't know Matt Shepard prior to the night they met him at the Fireside Lounge. Matt's autopsy came back after his death. Sure, it was six days after his death, but I'm sure the blood work was done while he was in the hospital. And there was only trace evidence of alcohol and marijuana in his system. Nothing stronger. No meth, no heroin. There were fingerprint bruises near Matt's groin area, something that probably happened in the truck. On the drive out to the cow pasture, Aaron and Russell maybe had no intention of killing Matt, but something snapped in Aaron, maybe a homophobic fear, but he got to a point where he knew this kid wasn't going to make it, so he and Russell left Matt. I'll give this to Stephen Jimenez. I do believe initially the kidnapping and beating of Matt was money motivated, much like Stephen Jimenez's expose and book were money related. Whoever said money is the root of all evil, they weren't wrong. Although I think most of us wish we did have more. I don't know. Maybe being part of the LGBT community, I am biased about what happened to Matt Shepard. Or just maybe I can cut through Stephen Jimenez's crap and see that the evidence is factual and his witnesses were questionable. What do you guys think? Let me know on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Until next time, Rainbow Warriors, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>